So hey everyone, welcome back to the Thinking Progressive podcast. This is a very special episode, our first actual podcast. Uh, and I have two guests I'm really excited uh, to have here today to discuss Bitcoin and some of the larger, broader implications that it will have on our society. So I'm going to let our guests introduce themselves. We have Simon Tang and Joe Sile. So Simon, why don't you just introduce yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Ron, uh, just for having me on the show. And uh, it's nice to do like kind of like a follow-up from our podcast way back when with Rolling with Simon. But um, yeah, uh, first a disclaimer, I'm by no means uh, an expert in any of this. So I'm more of a in, very informed uh, enthusiast. And, uh, yeah, I, I am a part of the believers that Bitcoin is a revolution. And, uh, you know, I'm here to argue for that point. So. Right on. Awesome. Uh, well, and, and I, I would even, uh, on Joe, my name is Joe uh, Saz here. Um, been in Bitcoin for, as a profession for the past four years. I'm an analyst trader, but of course I have gone down the rabbit hole and become a toxic maximalist. And I was going to, uh, I really like what you said there, you know, Simon, that you're here for the uh, revolution, right? And, and I take it one step further. Bitcoin isn't just a revolt. It's a revolt that creates a potential for a revolt without a single bullet needing to be fired. It's a very unique type of revolt. Um, so I, I, I just wanted to emphasize that point that Bitcoin is, is really unique in the sense that its ability to change the world might not need to uh, require as many deaths as uh, previous um, you know, uh, paradigm shifts have in, in humanity. So anyways, uh, there's my introduction and, uh, and uh, pleasure, to, pleasure to be here, Ron, thank you. Thank you. Now, that was a beautiful introduction. So speaking of revolution and just the, the crisis at hand and the transformation, right, that we are experiencing, both as, indiv you know, as all as individuals and as a collective, as you know, around the world, systems are collapsing, right? Systems that used to hold us up and prop us up, much of which was based on imperialism and, right, this, this you know, winner-take-all mentality, really primalistic, not really a transcendent way of, of viewing the universe. Now, we have the crisis. We have a pandemic, right? The economic crisis, which we haven't really even felt the, the wave of yet, right? The moment has happened, but time is a wave state, right? So we'll, we'll, we haven't really felt the ripple effects. Uh, and, and really the idea for this podcast came because I read an article, uh, and I'm just going to kind of get into the theme right now, is there's an Argentinian entrepreneur named Wences Ceceres, and he spent essentially the past several years building a Bitcoin holding startup. Uh, in Silicon Valley, and he's his main. It's called Zappo. Am I pronouncing that right, guys? Zappo. And um, so his <laughs> essentially <laughs> the argument is that he's been going to these you know, Silicon Valley millionaires and billionaires and saying, "Hey, Bitcoin is the future. Buy big, we'll hold it. Don't put it in a bank. Right? We're going to create a new structure, a new organization for holding these trend, these means of exchange." Uh, and and we're going to you know, do that for you. So he has, at this point, I believe, 10, roughly $10 billion worth of Bitcoin stored uh, from people. And the question that we're really going to open up into today is, if Bitcoin is the future, but the wealthy are already hoarding it, then why should we embrace it as the future? Because obviously there's, there's much, and, and this is a separate discussion, but much of the problems surrounding the crisis are systemic class issues, the maintaining of hierarchies beyond their usefulness, right? Uh, because we, you know, there's plenty of arguments about hierarchy. You know, we used to organize, yes, but we also, you know, it's been 25,000 years from the trees to the starship, right? Like we've, we've gone beyond these things. Um, so how do we, I, I think a fear as someone who's not a Bitcoin investor, has no vested interest in Bitcoin one way or the other, uh, I'll, I'll admit that I have a bias. I think there is something in a digital exchange not controlled by a government. I, I think that's a great idea. But I, I wonder how, when we talk about Bitcoin specifically, how Bitcoin can be the future if uh, the wealth is already so concentrated. Uh, and there's, you know, there's also a very high cost of entry. It's approximately eleven to 12000 a coin at this moment. Is that correct? So, I mean, I'll just put it out there. Um, what we'll do is I'll mute myself and you guys can just pick it up. And obviously, let's chime in together. Yeah, uh, you brought up a lot of points. And I feel like we should kind of take each one little by little. You know, let's focus on the economics for a sec here. And Simon, do you mind if I just kind of start that? You go ahead. Yeah. So 
my main, one of my biggest things is I believe in free markets. I believe that, you know, uh, the market should fucking crash, should crash, right? Uh, just clearly we are in a terrible economic scenario and there's no reason why the market should be performing so well. And it's very, very clear that this is not a free market. This is a market that's being manipulated and controlled by the federal reserve and, you know, pretty much BFFs in the top echelon of society. Right? So, I am all for free markets. I don't care who, how, who and what has how much money. Uh, what I do care about is the fact that everyone has equal power with that money. If everyone is participating with Bitcoin in an economy as a medium of exchange store value, that still gives everyone equal freedoms in terms of how they spend then anonymously and through peer to peer methods, their transacting power. That is the power of Bitcoin, not who holds how much. There are always going to be rich that are always going to be poor. But in this case, the rich can't print more and they might be able to do more with legislation, but that's going to be more difficult because if no one's paying taxes because they don't like the legislation that's being carried out, now you have political issues as well. So I think Bitcoin is probably one of the biggest checks and balances on free markets. What what buddies and at golf clubs that talk about sheeple, you know, and, and who care so little about us um, do, you know, a, a Bitcoin is really a, a method of freedom, whether or not someone has more than someone else. And uh, let's start with that one. Yeah, to piggyback off of what Joe was saying. So I tend to be in the middle when it comes to any type of investment, uh, speculation type of um, you know, anything, right? So when I look at Bitcoin, obviously this is a new technology. Um, with new technology, with any company or any type of startup requires tons of funding, right? You bring in the large whales to invest in this product and then the retail uh, comes afterwards, right? So in order for kind of Bitcoin to, you know, get to where it's, um, where we hope to, you know, for it to go, um, you need to bring in tons and tons of money, right? And, and the more money that goes into it, the more um, chances it's going to be adopted, you know, as, as the future currency or, you know, what have you. Um, so, but, you know, to answer that very first question, um, should this be something, you know, why is wealth uh, or people that are wealthy um, hoarding this? Well, it's, it's a technology, you know, and you need investors and, and these are the first, you know, wave of investors that are going to be coming in. Um, and there's also some fear to that too, right? Because uh, there's those who play the trading game and can uh, basically pull the rug beneath you and kind of like pull out and uh, cause the market to crash. And, you know, you develop this fear and then you get uh, retail investors selling their, um, you know, their ownership of Bitcoin. Um, and then they can buy back at a cheaper price, you know, and, and then you have this game that keeps on going um, until the, the coin is at such a worth where uh, one giant entity can't move the price anymore. You know, they, they don't have enough power. So right now, you know, just like anything else, uh, we're looking at, it is a speculation, right? We're, we're speculating on the future and, um, you know, we hope that, you know, this will be the future currency uh, for the globe, you know, for the entire uh, world. Um, but there's a lot of argument for it, right? And so, um, you know, that would be my, my uh, answer to the first piece. I would say the speculation depends on where you are. If you're in the United States, maybe it's becoming a little less of a speculative investment because clearly we're doing, you know, tons of things to devalue the dollar which is basically what would make something like Venezuela a place where Bitcoin wouldn't be a speculative investment. Even on its worst day, Bitcoin crashing from $20,000 to $3,000, the Venezuelan peso was crashing that much per hour. So it depends on where you are. And, and certainly in the West or in you know United States, uh, I, I would definitely agree that it's more on the speculation end of the spectrum as far as an investment. Um, but as far as money is concerned, it's definitely a, a, a necessity elsewhere, uh, in, in many elsewheres, you know, Zimbabwe, Argentina, Turkey, um, Venezuela, handful of other places. Um, 
uh, you know, during the Greek collapse as well. Um, so I, 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 that would be my one comment is that I, I, I don't really like to think of Bitcoin as too much of, of a speculative investment because it just it's a relative concept. Okay, thank you for that. And so I have a few questions for both of you. I think this is a really interesting start. So um, I'll, start, I'll, I'll just mention with you, you started with, you mentioned the, um, you know, Bitcoin is a technology, right? It's a, it's a whale, so you need investors. But so when we're developing any tool, right? Every tool serves a purpose. That's why we invent tools. That's why we invent companies, we invent organizations, et cetera, right? All, and, and we can, I, I hope we can come to, a, well, I'm speaking from technology as a point of any, any manipulatable tool in the universe, right? That we can use to our advantage. These are technologies, Bitcoin being one, um, the dollar being another, right? But should, should a technology that is meant to serve the means of exchange of a people, so you know, Bitcoin as a transactional tool, um, if, if, your, if your mutual vision of a worldwide Bitcoin adoption comes true, then we would assume Bitcoin would be exchanged for material goods, which are limited, right, to some extent for the time being. So with that, with that being said, like, why would you want to have a currency tool, like the, the tool you're making to be a, a means of exchange, why would you want people who from the very beginning, you know, start out with so much more? And I think Joe kind of hit on this point too. So I think you guys can both answer this question is like, you know, you're, I understand that Bitcoin spending power, right? You talk about spending power and I, I understand what that concept is, but we also have to take it from the moment, right? Like if, if we could snap our fingers and this was true at the moment, then those with large stores of Bitcoins could acquire significantly more material resources and those with none right even if you did some sort of public generation let's say you did a you know a global buy-in program where at this moment everyone's got an account and we're you know and you're mining from some i don't know you know some social mining group whatever the case may be right we, we acknowledge disparities but again disparities have to be viewed in the moment and right now the moment is people with large wealth disparities as it already stands uh, manipulate huge swaths of the government. I mean, right, this is what power is, not the government, it's the people who control the means. You know, Amazon controls logistics, right? Facebook controls social media. These are individuals who control sections of society. Again, how does that, how's that revolutionary? That just seems, in fact, Bitcoin seems like it would just make it worse, right? The, the disparities in Bitcoin, I own zero Bitcoin, right? We snap our fingers today and that's the market, I'm SOL, right? So, so I'll, pass it, I'll pass it off on that. Yeah, uh, I don't know if Joe, you want to go first or you want me? Uh, please go ahead. Okay. Um, so I guess to counter or not even counter that argument, like that is definitely something um, to consider, right? Um, where there, the wealth has, has a huge, I guess, advantage to uh, the poor in, in that sense. Um, and this would be the case in all society, right? Wealth, well, the wealthy always has way more of an advantage to everyone else. And because of the fiat currency, they're able to really control all the markets. They're able to control the government through lobbying, right? They're able to control um, how the stock market flows, right? They can control uh, any, pretty much anything they want. They can, they have full power to make it happen with, uh, with their fiat currency. Um, now with, Bitcoin, this is what changes the game. Um, I'll just give a, a simple, something that's happened to me in the past, right? Uh, since my money is in the bank, right? My, my, my money is in Chase, Chase Bank. Um, I wanna take out a certain amount of money on the weekend to pay for something I found on Craigslist. Um, that you know is is over a specific limit that I can take out of the ATM, right? And let's say the bank is closed. Um, I have to wait until Monday to get my money, right? That's already one thing where the bank has control over when I have access to my my my, my money, right? I um, or or I should say hard money, right? Uh, the the cash in hand, so. Right there, you have already power within the, 
this this corporation or, or this bank, right? I have no control of of being able to get that money uh, in any other way, right? It, out of my own account, my own account, right? With Bitcoin, you the the, the whole selling piece is that it's decentralized. No one controls this. This is purely a technology um, with no no owners, right? Um, the only thing that I could argue is the 51% attack. Uh, but at this point, I highly doubt anybody has, uh, and Joe, you could probably chime in on that. Um, but I don't believe anybody has the power to do any type of 51% attack or anywhere near that, right? So the power for the wealthy, they have no control over what I have. I become, I've essentially become my own bank. I have full access to my own um, amount of, you know, money. Um, another thing to consider is, you know, will this be used as a medium of exchange or is this going to continue to become some sort of like store of value uh, type of deal where essentially what we use as gold in this, you know, climate gold has hit its all time high um, these past few, I think it was like last week or so. And, you know, nobody goes around carrying pieces of gold in their pocket, buying things at the grocery store. You know, it's a, it's a mean, a way to store your wealth. And regardless, even if you are poor, there needs to be education, right? There needs to be education to teach the poor to sell, to save money, you know? And even though, it, you know, I, I, and that's a whole different conversation itself because I know um, some don't even have that possibility to do so they're in such a bad situation you know um but again i believe education it goes all goes back to education again um but at least you know with something like a tool like bitcoin those wealthy have no control of, of being able to touch any of my money they can't use it to go invest in other you know um avenues to to make more money on their own you know the, when you put your money in a bank that bank takes your money and goes and puts it into whatever and makes interest on it, you know, without you getting a penny, you know, so. Fractional reserve banking, 90, yeah, 10, they invest exactly. 90%. It's crazy. It, you know, you don't have, like, you think you have control over your money, but you really don't when you, when you give it to um, these, these financial services, you know? So that would be my biggest argument um, for Bitcoin on, on why, you know, we need to jump on this um, bad wagon and, you know, get on that. Um, in terms of the wealthy hoarding it, now, Bitcoin, you can buy it at any fraction. You can buy, a, a, what is it, like 0.00000001 um, of a Bitcoin. You don't have to buy uh, in full increments. So the cost of entry is, you know, a penny. You know, like you can get into it with any amount of uh, uh, currency that you have, you know. Um, can you spend, can you spare $5, you know, every month and put it into this thing? Uh, just like any 401k, any, um, you know, a retirement fund, it, you know, it's all, it, 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 even though it's a speculative, still in my point of view, a speculative investment because we don't know the future. Um, you know, if you're willing to take that risk, you can buy $5 worth of Bitcoin and build upon that, you know? Um, so that's where, you know, I'll, I'll let Joe. So I'll, I'll jump in and I'll kind of bring it back to where we started for a second build. We're talking about some income inequality type stuff here, you know, rich hoarding. Um, pretty much this is, this is what it boils down. And you were talking about fiat and, and let's bring up the fiat issue too. The fiat issue is that fiat money is scarce for you, for Ron, for me but it's not scarce for the people that can press an enter button and how, and the number of dollar bills that they want to introduce into circulation. And oftentimes it's not for our sake. It's actually to our detriment, uh, to, to inflation. In fact, the cost of milk and eggs 10, 15 years ago, uh, was cheaper than it is now. It's not because milk and eggs are harder to produce it's because our dollars gotten weaker. That's because they're printing more, mo more money. So this ties into, um, our wealth inequality with a scarce fiat that only benefits them, it, it turns into what I like to observe as the Mario Kart rule. The Mario Kart rule, I'm assuming we've all played, uh, you know, 
part of the gaming generation. Uh, when you're in first place and you hit a question box, you might get a banana. When you're in last place, you might get a heat-seeking bomb that runs all the way to the first place play it, right? And that's pretty much how I view balance, right? That's how balance is, balance is viewed in such a simple format, that if you're in last place, you have the most uh, provided to you to succeed. If you're in first place, you have the least provided you, to you to succeed because you're already succeeding, right? And the way that the fiat system is designed in parallel with the number of people running it is to make it so that we have a backward system. We have already a system where the rich are getting richer and they are using the eighth place in Mario Kart rule to give them a heat seeking missile to send eighth place down further, right? So there's already a problem with fiat and, and it's basically that it is scarce except when they need it. And they is a very small group of they. Um, so it doesn't, you know, back to Zappo, which already sounds, I don't know much about it, but I custody is a fucking scam to me in Bitcoin. It is Bitcoin is about being your own bank. Like Simon mentioned, it's about self sovereignty. Um, and I, I do believe that whether or not this, this service is going to continue to exist for a long period of time, uh, it still means that Bitcoin is a money of the people because instead of having to hide cash under your mattress and then worry about whether or not you can transact, you will still be able to participate on a global network, peer-to-peer -peer network to, to do whatever, buy whatever good and service you want. There's a ton of key words that I, that, you know, are very popular in Bitcoin, but you know, unconfiscatable, anonymous, peer-to-peer, -peer, um, censorship resistant, which is very important, right? And this ties us right back into politics. Now, if we have all these politicians that are doing a ton of things to keep themselves in their positions of power, and, there's, and they're financially enslaving us by taking 30 to 40% of your income, taxing 8% on everything you buy at the grocery store, taxing you on the gasoline you buy, taxing you on the fucking cigars you buy, and then they're financially crippling you, crippling you at, at just about every turn of your life. Um, which means, you know, how much does our voice actually matter in, in the form of a vote, right? I believe money matters much more in the form of a vote, and that's proven through lobbying. Uh, I believe Princeton did a study that proved that very uh, clearly that laws made over the past something like 30 plus years have a, cor a direct correlation to the amount of money spent on, on lobbying. So Bitcoin changes, you know, uh, I, I know there's an income inequality that, that really feels like it's an elephant in the room, but the truth is it, it really doesn't matter because what, what matters most is the fact that if they spend the Bitcoin, they can't get more. There are no bailouts. There is no creation of new wealth with Bitcoin. Obviously there is a mining distribution protocol, but that is fixed and unbreakable without consensus. And uh, the consensus required is the consensus of everyone actively participating and running a full node. So that could be you and that could be all three of us. And, and that could be Bill Gates. That could be George Soros. It could be everyone with an equal say in the protocol's future. So that is very important to me. And the better politicians do at a point where everyone is transacting within, through an anonymous uh, you know, paint settlement layer, then what are they going to do if they do things that, that benefit 10, you know, uh, let's say thousands of people instead of benefiting 330 plus million uh, Americans, right? Um, people are going to start saying, well, the government now has to ask me for my money because they can't trace it since I'm transacting anonymously on a peer-to-peer -peer network. So we now have to do things that incentivize people to pay us. Now they have to fix the potholes in the road. Now they have to um, create paradigms in the political system that benefit the majority, do the greatest good for the greatest number of people. So despite the income inequality that may arise and may exacerbate in some ways as a result of massive uh, quantities of Bitcoin in, in, in probably the smallest number of wallets, um, there's still a lot of good that can come out of it. Even if a Bitcoiner with 10,000 Bitcoin owns a city, uh, and, and, and a Bitcoiner with a farm owns 0.1 Bitcoin, there is still the same equal financial power that uh, um, comes as a result of this. It, it's the same whether you have all the Bitcoin or, or you know, tons or, or very few. Cool. Well, I think you hit on a lot of really good points. Um, some of the kind of highlights and things I want to get into. 
Um, I, I had some other questions. So it seems like though, it seems like the consensus between both the guys, like we, we kind of like the elephant in the room is the wealth inequality. Yes, there's, in terms of who holds Bitcoin on a global scale, because we're talking about mass adoption, it's super concentrated. Um, and it seems like we disagree. We're going to move on. But it seems like we kind of disagree on the gravity of that. You know, I'm, I'm making the argument that so long as we live in a material world, those with, a, you know, 10 billion Bitcoin versus those with, you know, a fraction of a Bitcoin are going to live in two radically different lives if, if Bitcoin is the means of exchange, right? So, uh, and, and this kind of goes back to, you kind of mentioned this. You said there's always rich and there's always poor. Um, and the kind of, you kind of, you, I think your underlying theme with taxes is, I, I feel like there's almost like a taxation is theft kind of message where you'd like to, but you also look at it as a, an accountability tool for politicians, which I like, right? And, and I want to be clear with both of you guys, I love your highlights of what, why Bitcoin's better than the dollar. I agree, like that's not up for debate. You know, I, I understand the value of, the, of a new means of transaction, right? Beyond something that the government controls. Um, and certainly we are beholden to them and Right, there's more millionaires in the Senate, right? Than I think how many of them are millionaires? It's like ninety-eight percent or something crazy like that, right? So it's there's serious wealth concentrated in there, um, but I, you know, I question the idea of you know there always has to be a rich and a poor because that you know from a cosmological standpoint goes against the very nature of the universe. The, the universe has been changing since the moment it came into existence and nothing has ever not been subject to change. So we live in a society now where through, for example, the exponential growth of technology, things like Bitcoin can proliferate, right? And they can proliferate beyond barriers where you can talk to any other person in another country about Bitcoin, you can exchange them. Uh, but this is part of a larger wave we've been riding of technological advancement. Why in a society would we have to have a poor? I mean, I'm not saying that there would be, because again, I don't think anyone arguing for equality, anyone I think log logically arguing it, isn't arguing for equality of outcomes, right? But of circumstance. So the idea that you know, there really is, an, uh, you're not, your birth lottery doesn't determine how you can exist within the universe for the rest of your life, right? For, for, the, for the vast majority of planet Earth, that's the case, right? Uh, even many here in the United States. And it's, you know, the, the writing's on the wall. It's about to get much worse here in the United States, right? But after the fact, right, let's say there's the collapse and, and you, you're pushing for the Bitcoins uh, to be the, the, the replacement, so to speak, if we can imagine this scenario, right? This is our opportunity at the moment. Would, would you be open to a Bitcoin introduction with mass redistribution? Because again, if you have someone with 10 billion and you have someone with a fraction, we can philosophize all we want about the buying power, but in terms of material exchange, there's a radical difference there and, and what that will do in society. So again, like how would you, if you're going to introduce it at a global level, how does that look? Like how do you do that and overcome the inequities that would just, again, it would, it would be more harmful than the already harmful system that's collapsing in front of our eyes. Uh, because if, if I can just, you know, if I have 10 billion, I got my walled garden, right? I got my private militia versus the people who live in the cities, which, you know, their taxes pay for like piping and water and et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to pass it off to you. It's like, ha why does that have to be? If we're going to do a global currency and, and really change things, right? That's the whole point. We don't want to reinvent the same just to have it crash in the future, or we don't want to make a better world for the people who already live in, you know, above the clouds. How, well, let's, how we, let's talk. Let me hit that because I, 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 I totally agree with you. You know, does there have to be this whole system? And, and it does to me come back to taxation. And, and we fought, you know, everyone was celebrating the 4th of July, right, in America, or most people. And one of my favorite things that I saw that day was never forget that the people you're celebrating today were cop killers, traitors, and tax evaders. And they were tax evaders over a 2% freaking tax on tea and sugar, something like that, right? Now we've come to a point where we're losing our income. If you're making 50K a year, let's say, which, you know, in many places, maybe in the Southwest, Midwest, you know, a number of other geolocations within the United States, that's enough money to pay for a decent living, right? But if you're losing 30% of that, now you're reaching the poverty level. You're reaching literally the level where you are living for your expenses. 
and that is, uh, I, I agree with you 100%. I, I think that the that there doesn't necessarily need to be a wave or a generation of people that can't afford houses, you know, which is basically where we're at now. Um, so I, how does Bitcoin change this? It comes all the way back again to what what public servants do to serve their constituents and, and the people of their, you know, of the nation, right? Uh, if what they're doing is pocketing all this money and uh, serving themselves, then that's clearly not the greatest good for the greatest number of people. If they're doing the exact opposite out of necessity, then there are going to be tons of things that change as a result of that. And one of those things may very well be not necessarily we make sure everyone has a house or we make sure, you know, every, every, everyone's living this, you know, golden great life. You know, there's going to be people on different economic levels because they provide different goods and services to society. That's just a fact. There's yeah, but demand. But, but does it have to be below? Like, like, why does it have to be that they can't have certain dignities? Like, why can't it be that everyone has a place to live and everyone can eat? Like, because if you talk about like, your ability to, you can, I'm learning a lot. It's really fascinating. And I don't mean to interrupt you. I want to give it right back, but you, you're, I'm, you're getting me excited, right? Simon should have told you this. I'm getting excited. <laughs> yeah, the idea is, you know, if, if, why does it have to be um, that not everyone's going to have a place to live? Like why? Like, again, we live in, a, in an era where technology allows us to do things that were literally unimaginable two decades ago, a decade ago, five years ago, right? Like, it's it's exponential growth. So why not, like, if if we create, if you, what you're saying is true, right? If this is the, the view of the universe that we take, that not everyone can have housing, then that's the world we'll create. But we could just as easily create the alternative because the resources and technology now exist. The question is why not leap forward? In, in, in how does, like, and I want to get back to that one major question, do you support, like, redistribution? Because otherwise, if you don't of Bitcoin, Okay. Then the only thing you do is perpetuate the same, the same, you know, the, the vision of the universe that, you know what, fuck it, some people, and by birth lottery being the determination, right? That's what it is. Okay. Those people In some cases. I, I've seen rich kids, you know, with, with uh, wealthy parents do drugs and lose their teeth to crystal meth and become worthless members of society, right? So there's definitely... Um, in my opinion, does everyone deserve a house? I believe you reap what you sow. I, I, I do believe that there should be some sort of philo philanthropic uh, processes, uh, and, and we do have some of them in existence today, you know, food stamps and such. Um, do I believe everyone should get a house? Well, if you would prefer to uh, pull the copper out of the walls and spend it on crystal meth, we, we probably have enough houses in America to put every homeless person in a house. It just depends on where they choose to live, right? But if they're going to pull the copper out the walls to, to scrap pennies and, and, and get a little dime bag or some, some, you know, of drugs, then, you know, that's kind of their choice, right? So uh, they're, now the birth lottery thing that you're talking about, which is, I think, more important to me, um, that does also change as a result of Bitcoin. We've... Uh, probably seen systemic racism. We know that it goes back to the, you know, decades ago um, and even centuries ago. And I've even watched documentaries on how banks were told and bankers were told not to let, let's say African-Americans have the ability to buy or, or own a house in certain areas like white neighborhoods, right? Like so there is a birth lottery, go ahead. Oh no, uh, one, you know, Black Wall Street, uh, terrible history um, situation with you know systemic racism, um, but you know I, I you know uh, if I could speak now on this topic, I think we're getting into um, you know more philosophical discussion, <laughs> kind of apples to oranges type of deal, um, and so I, I don't consider this a currency, Bitcoin you know, what have you issue. I think what you're talking about is a human issue. Um, personally, me, I believe, uh, you know, we are human and I believe we will always have the rich and we will always have the poor. Straight, dude, I mean, Ron, you know, you and I have had these conversations. Um, personally, um, you're just discussing about the human heart, you know, or, or just humans in general. There are those who are greedy 
right? And there are those who, uh, and typically those who are greedy, who are, tend to be the ones in power, right? And they will forever, uh, unless if there's a human change, a human, you know, heart change um, to want to help those in need, we'll never have this change. Uh, you know, well, how is a redistribution, you know, how would that even happen? And if there was a redistribution, how do, how do we know that those that we give them or that those who get the money will use it, you know, to buy goods and service to better their lives, you know, rather than to destroy their own life. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a tough discussion. You know, I think it's, it's really, at the end of the day, boils down to humanity, uh, what desires we have, you know, um, what we care about, um, you know, not everybody is a cheerful giver, right? Um, but the goal, you know, you know, in, in the martial arts, like those of us who have the power, right? We, even in, you know, in the past or whatever, we are to use this power to defend those who are weak, right? That don't have for themselves, that um, suffer, right? From, from those who are tyrants, where there needs to be defenders, right? Those who are just stronger. And I think this is the same situation when it comes to currency or, or money or wealth. You're going to have tyrants. You're going to have people that want to solely just hurt others, you know, take from them. Um, and there needs to be those who, you know, like uh, in a sense where we uh, uh, want to help, you know, as in this certain situation, I know we've had this conversation as well, where education is a divider, right? Education um, is one of the biggest things that can separate those that are poor to being able to, to, you know, change their lives, right. For, for, you know, the better. And even, you know, just thinking about poor and rich and what have you, I mean, a homeless person in the United States is, is rich compared to a person living in a third world country that has, that eats dirt, you know, to survive, that eats clay to survive. It's, you know, at what level are we talking here? You know, it, like there will always be someone that has less and there will always be um, someone who has more. It's just, I don't know how, I, you know. Oh, you're, I, you're I think I just wanted to get, because I think I understand the difference of what Ron is trying to say. He's, he's talking about the, the birthplace of where you start the race. And I still believe that Bitcoin brings about the, Mario Kart rule. If you're in last place, it does not, it benefits you in a way to get you up to a position. It doesn't benefit you much further unless you can manage to exploit, because, you know, uh, exploit business somehow, medical care, right, is heavily, grossly overpriced. There's tons of exploitative uh, economic practices going on today, and there's still a lot that needs to get done to take care of that. Um, but where you're born does have a lot to do with where you end up and where your family and your future generations end up. That is very interesting to discuss and how Bitcoin can change that. I, I, I think my best answer to you would be that it makes it so that the political landscape and the economic landscape is a fair fight. They have a chance, at least. Now they don't have to worry about making nothing and providing nothing to their families who will then net nothing in the future unless you know an, an anomaly makes it through school with, with A's to a college and so on. Uh, I, what it does is it gives everyone again equal power and power through financial voice. That is the most powerful voice that anyone will have in this country and it is repetitively proven. So I, I think that that is what Bitcoin does in my eyes. It, do, it replaces your inability to communicate because you are poor and unable to vote into a position where your money matters, even the fraction that you have matters to someone who's trying to be a politician and do the best, the greatest good for your, you know, the, 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 the their constituency. It's that, that 0.03 Bitcoin that they might have maybe, uh, you know, uh, several fractions down the line, a politician that, that $5 worth of Bitcoin will still matter to them. So uh, it, it's, it will still be up to the person to choose who to support. Right now, we don't choose. They basically have their positions locked in, right? Senators, at the very least, with lifelong you know, positions. 
I, I hear what you guys are saying. So I want to just have a couple points. Um, Simon, certainly didn't mean to take it off track. My whole kind of connecting the dots is that if we're talking about global Bitcoin adoption, which is kind of like what we've been talking about, or even Bitcoin mass adoption in the United States, right? The, the key thing is, and you guys both keep hitting on, it, it's, it's a more fair you know, currency in terms of personal power, right? I agree, right? I don't disagree with that. But I, I challenge the idea that it can be called fair when if we, and again, without, without some sort of, and redistribution, forget about the concept as a personal issue, just as like a logistical issue. If we just snap our fingers and changed it, you know, I don't see how we could call it fair purchasing power when it would be so grossly concentrated. And, and we can kind of talk about this a little bit too, guys. We can talk about um, your perspective on like, you know, the cost is super prohibitive, right? Like even, I know I can buy a fraction, but one Bitcoin is worth, you know, at the moment, uh, approximately eleven to $12,000, right? So it, there's, you know, and, and that matters. Like that's, we don't, we, these ideas like don't exist in a vacuum, right? Like they exist in, in the material world that we occupy. So that's, that's kind of what I'm doing. So like, does the, is the cost of entry hurting Bitcoin? Like, is it as a speculative, you know, investment? Is it hurting the technology? Is that bad for it? Is it, uh, would it be better if there was a way to de-speculate, like, you know, make it publicly? Like, how does that work? How does it become better? Um, and how do more people get involved, right? Because that's a real problem we face in the moment. Um, so how does that work? I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable uh, going second if you want to go, Simon. Yeah. Um, so the question, I think, was like in multiple pieces. Can you like break down um, sure. the, you know, we'll go one by one. Yeah, no problem. So, so the first thing I'd say is let, let's just be like, let's start with a, a very Bitcoin centric thing, which is, you know, Bitcoin is approximately eleven to $12,000 right now. We're talking about a more fair currency. But if I want to get in, right, um, because Bitcoin is tied to speculation in the real world, it's very, there's a huge barrier to entry for many people, even in the United States, right, to, to get in. So how, is that good for Bitcoin? Is it good for Bitcoin holders, but bad for other people? Like, is it good for the technology? How does, you know, because you guys, I, I understand, are interested in, the, in that aspect of it. So how does that, how does that further the mission? Right. If it's if the if there's a barrier to entry that's so significant and so concentrated. So I can answer that. I mean, um, just looking at Bitcoin's volatility, um, you know, disclaimer, like this is not investment advice that, you know, don't take this podcast and roll it in and start buying Bitcoin. Um, um, so tomorrow the price could be a thousand dollars. Right. Like the the price of Bitcoin is solely due to the market cap, right? Whatever we put in is what it, its total worth is divided by the amount of coins currently available, right? To the, um, that, that's uh, in supply, right? So this money can fluctuate every single day. People can, um, in one night, it can drop 80%. Right. I, I happened to me. <laughs> I got, yeah, you know, I had a really one trade that went really bad and sour, you know, and I lost out and other people won from that. Right. And then this is no different from the stock market. This is no different from any type of speculative investment. Right. Which is what it currently is right now. Right. Um, in my opinion, I think it's still it's speculation, you know. Um, and as I mentioned before, right, where with the, whales being able to pull money out so that they can take money from the pot drop the price um get a bunch of those the, the retail investors scared get them to sell their share and then they come back in at a lower entry point accumulating more bitcoin winning this essential game you know um when mass global adoption happens you know let's say let's say everybody decides to let's just give up on gold and they realize gold is like, I think there's some, uh, some asteroid or something where they discovered that uh, has gold. And if we can get this asteroid and mine it, then the supply of gold becomes astronomically, astronomically larger than it is currently dropping the value of gold. Right. So 
let's say something like that happens and investors want to go into something else. The market cap of gold, I, I, I don't know exactly how much it is, but I'm sure it's within the trillions, you know, some probably actually. around 10 to 11 trillion by now. Yeah. Some astronomical of that amount goes into Bitcoin, right? At that point, all those who own the coin, um, you have the total market cap divided by the total supply. Everybody's amounts go up, right? So the value can change at any moment, but once it gets to that point where it's global, um, you know, globally adopted, this price point probably won't be able to be um, moving as, or moved as much, less volatility, making it, um, you know, its value and its place. So at that point, right, we're talking probably Bitcoin being worth, you know, half a million, hundred thousand dollars, half a million, million dollars a coin. Um, and this is why having increments is so important if global adoption ever does happen, right? Um, but, all right, let's say Bitcoin goes the other way, okay? The dollar value changes, but the value of the Bitcoin never changes. One Bitcoin will always be one Bitcoin. 0 0.05 Bitcoins will always be 0 0.05 Bitcoin. And so um, my point with that is being the dollar, the, the you know, dollar can go inflated, um, can be worthless tomorrow, but the Bitcoin value doesn't change. It's, it's uh, deflationary. You know, there's a, there's a finite supply. It cannot be inflated or deflated. If we get, if, if the United States dollar completely disappears tomorrow, um, what would we be using for currency, right? Would we, if, if we're in this digital world, uh, fiat is no longer, uh, you know, just garbage, right? Like it's toilet paper. Um, what, how do we, how do we then put a value on Bitcoin, right? How do we then say, okay, well, how, how many Bitcoin is worth, you know, bread or whatever, right? This is something that I think where, again, the power goes into the people's hands. It's now we can say, okay, we can decide as, as, um, what Joe was mentioning with protocol, I have power in the in 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 what happens with Bitcoin if I own it. Right? I can vote. I can make votes. I can decide um, how the, the the currency moves. Or you know, uh, if Joe, you want to talk about you know forks and all that good stuff. Um, but votes have to happen before anything major happens to the coin. Right? Any type of technology you want to add or take away. Um, but with that being said, right the power goes back into your hands. Like it's, it's, it's something that you control. Nobody else has control. If the banks decide to say, hey, we're taking you know, everything, um, we need your money, you can't have access to it. They probably could do that. Like what's to say that they can't, right? The, go the government needs help. They're gonna pull out an, a, another percentage of your money um, on top of your taxes. Like who knows what can happen. But um, with that, you know, I always go back to the point. It's like one Bitcoin will always be one Bitcoin, right? Regardless of the volatility to, to enter. If you want to get into the game, watch, you know, the price um, volatility Buy when you want to get in, you know, if, if it, it, it might fall tomorrow six to six thousand dollars, it might go to twenty thousand, you know, next week. Like it's really hard to say right now because it is a uh, an investment, right? Speculative investment. Um, so, but the, so, yeah, but go ahead. Uh, I want to I focus on the prohibitive cost of entry concept because I feel like that's, like Ron, that, that seems to be something that you were, are, are really like, uh, is very important to you for, for us to analyze, right? Prohibitive cost of entry in, in, if we were to look at gold, for example, on a timeline that gold is, you know, obviously, has a much longer timeline, it's moved up in value in time. If, if gold had done what Bitcoin has did uh, in, in, you know, 10 years or so, um, then of course there would be a prohibitive cost of entry in some ways. You could make that same argument for gold, right? Uh, if gold went from $26 an ounce to $20,000 an ounce, people would be having to buy much smaller fractions of gold in order to preserve their capital and increase it, right? 
So as far as prohibitive cost of entry is concerned, don't think of a Bitcoin as your only way to increase, enhance, or whatever, preserve your wealth. The $10 that you put in every week in your dollar cost average might net you only a fraction of a Bitcoin, but that's still not prohibiting you from entering Bitcoin. It is done so intentionally to allow people to have no barrier to enter Bitcoin. It is denominated to in the in eighth zero past a decimal point, and there's even talk of sub Satoshi units now. So, uh, you know, with the Lightning Network about. So, I, I think prohibitive cost of entry is kind of something that I'm not too concerned with because fractions of Bitcoin exist the same way that if this happened in gold and Bitcoin never existed. And this was a, a phenomenon that happened in the early 1900s where, you know, during the executive order that, you know, uh, Satoshi's, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto's birthday references, which is the executive order that the uh, all American citizens needed to um, turn their gold over to the, to the state, right? They had to uh, give up their gold. Uh, and the government took it for, I think, somewhere around 20 something dollars an ounce and sold it back at $30 plus an ounce. Um, now, imagine if, if gold went from $20 to you know, thousands, I, we, we would be probably dealing with a similar issue. People would just be buying smaller fractions because that's what their dollar can afford, but they would still be winning. This, uh, in this sense, it is not a zero sum game if multiple participants are entering the market. The zero sum game only is the result of trading. Uh, and that's a completely different game. Uh, and, and, you know, we're not proponents. So I'm not necessarily a salesman of trading here. You know, I, I, I most certainly recommend a dollar cost average over anything else and, and a hodl, of course. But it looked like you had something you wanted to say there, Ron. I yeah, appreciate it. And I, I see where you guys are going. Uh, the fractionary aspect. So the, the argument is that like the, the barrier to entry doesn't really exist because you can get it at any point for whatever value, right? Um, but I think Simon made a really good point, right? Let, let's imagine, uh, you know, what, or we could say that one Bitcoin is always worth one Bitcoin, right? That's a fair statement. I agree with you, right? But then, so, but I think we still haven't answered kind of the, one of the core underlying questions of the theme of our discussion, which is that if one Bitcoin is worth one Bitcoin, and let's say, because there's mass adoption, again, in, in our imaginary scenario, the dollar disappears tomorrow, Bitcoin is the replacement, you can buy in for whatever fraction, et cetera, et cetera, right? If one Bitcoin is worth one Bitcoin, how does the guy or girl or you know, uh, individual with 5 million Bitcoin not essentially have godlike capabilities over the village that com collectively owns half a coin? How do, if one coin is one, worth one coin and it becomes a means of exchange, right? Like the dollar, like gold. I mean, the comparisons are great, but I think it's, it's not enough, uh, respectfully, it's not enough to compare Bitcoin to gold because gold was um, a monocle of exchange for a different universe. Bitcoin has the potential to, be some, to, to bring in a different, an entirely different paradigm of exchange. So I, I don't think this, you know, to say that uh, it's, you know, we can say, okay, you can get it for whatever cost, but the reality of it is, right, in this very moment, because I think we always have to consider the immediate present as our point of departure, you know, there is how, so reconcile that for me. How, does, how do you function a society where we're telling the majority of people to buy fractions, but people already hold millions? Well, right now people might own millions of dollars worth, but the only person with a wallet size of approximately 850,000 to 1.1 million is Satoshi Nakamoto himself. Thank you. For Those that. coins are unknown what, what's going to happen, if ever anything. So, but, but let's, let's, let's continue to explore that, right? There are clearly examples of uh, whales with maybe even 100,000 plus Bitcoin, right? And what's to say that if Bitcoin hits a dollar relative value of 10 million a piece and those become, they become the new elites of the world, let's say, what's to say that they won't abuse their financial authority and such and create a uh, almost, uh, what's, what's the, uh, who had the monopoly on, on uh, the railroads and iron at the time? I, I, I can't think of it, but he basically, well, it was Rockefeller, Steel, Rockefeller, Steel. Uh, there's, 
there was another name, but I, I'll, it'll come back to me. But basically what he did was he made it so that like everyone had to, all his employees had to buy the food from his store and he obviously marked everything up. So basically he financially starved people, right? Uh, prevented them. He, he basically paid them, but then said, I um, could be taking all that back. Thank you very much. Right. And that I feel like is a little bit of what you're trying to say. What's going to happen if these whales or, you, you know, these, these Titans even further, um, run a town or a state or a nation, right? Um, I, the, the, the fact of the matter is, is that Bitcoin, once it's spent, it's spent, it go, it's out of your control. Um, and they're going to have to do things in order to achieve those, those um, you know, ambitions. So when they spend that Bitcoin, it's going to transfer to another hand and they're going to lose it forever. So it, it, it turns that decision into a very calculated market decision, right? Do I want to do this with my Bitcoin? And if so, uh, what, are the, what are the outcomes, right? But if you, you know, naturally have a system where if you spend Bitcoin, you can't create more and in propagate this rich getting richer scenario, then um, I think it kind of cleans up a lot of that mess. Um, there's a lot of speculation there, very difficult rabbit hole to go down because, um, you know, we just don't know, you know, we, it's like a lot of these problems are uh, a known unknown is, is, is even hard to speculate on. We don't even know the unknown unknowns up in here, right. In, in this kind of uh, concept. But I, I think that it's important to note if people are big, you know, bag holders, they will have undoubtedly more um, influence in the future. And there might be some with nefarious purposes and there may be some with uh, less exploitative purposes as well. That's not something we can control. But if they were to, we can revolt the same way that maybe other countries are revolting right now. If someone, if, if the fucking Gemini brothers who own, I think somewhere around 100,000 Bitcoin or was it, um, decide to try to be tyrants, well, that's two people and maybe they can buy an army, but you know, that's no different than any other point in history. And if those coins get burned, then they are burned, they're gone. Maybe those guys want to burn them before they die. Bam, clean, you know, you, you got yourself the property of the people. I have one just follow up question. So I really like that last point, right? So the, so if we're saying that it's just, you're just like, all right, well, whatever, this is history repeating itself essentially, right? There's tyrants, there's revolution, there's, ty you know, but the, I think the underlying theme that I'm, I'm trying to find is, is can Bitcoin be something more? Like, does it have to be a, just another version of tyranny? Like, or does the technology allow for a more trendent, transcendent experience? Like, does there have to be kings and fiefdoms? Because, you know, I know we're speculating, but I think we're kind of not speculating in the sense that, like, it's, you know, if we're talking about the distribution of resources and there's an immense amount, I mean, we have real life examples, right? There's an immense amount and a few hands of people, you know, it's not even, and I, I actually, Joe, I, I think you mentioned nefarious. I believe it or not, I'd argue, I think it's a battle of good versus good. It's their vision of universal good versus ours or mine or, you know, someone else's and, and they might not jive. But, you know, that's the, the argument is, you know, do we, because, because so much of it is not in the sense of Bitcoin, but of the traditional wealth, right? Because so much of it is historical, right? A lot of you're born into this fortune and, you know, it gets passed generation by generation. And to your point, you made a lot of great points about the interwoving of the government, right? And how it just transfers. I, I'm with you hundred percent. And that's what, that's what drives me is like, why does Bitcoin have to, like, if, if we're saying there's nothing we can do about it, I challenge that. Is there something, and this is for you guys, you guys are the experts, not me, but is there something that could be done with Bitcoin or another thing you could imagine? Um, and, and I don't know if this has been done to death, but you, how could it not be the same? Because again, if we had the choice, given that it hasn't happened yet, it's an unknown future to your point, and let's imagine we have some agency in this decision, you know, collectively, why would we circle, you know, why would we just jump into that? I, that doesn't sound exciting to me. That sounds like more of the same, the same that got us here. Uh, so that's that's my question. Why? Why? Well, so what's the, your, your question is, what is the difference essentially between what we have now and, and a possible similar future that Bitcoin is right now creating with the fiefdoms and the kingdoms yeah. and, the, and the rulers? And, and you answered to some extent by saying once it's spent, it's spent. I get that. But again, there's going to be a moment of transition where, you know, there's fractions versus, you know, 100,000 errors or whatever we would call them. Right. Um, so how, why like why can't it be? 
better than hierarchy? Like, why can't it be, be better than that? Or is it because, and, and look, there's nothing wrong with this, right? This is history that we're talking about history. Is it because that you guys love it and you have it and you would be at the top and that's not, I'm not criticizing or, or uh, questioning in terms of you've done that, but is it just, you know what, this would be very much in my favor and I'm willing to say like that, you know, that's why I would want it to be the same. You know, this, this just brings me right back to an old kind of philosophical thought that, you know, we're kind of in this midst of a second renaissance, right? Um, our survival needs, particularly amongst us three most likely and amongst most of the people in the United States are, are generally met. And I believe that the next human evolution is going to be more of a spiritual, mental, emotional type of evolution. So, I mean, touching on that point, how does Bitcoin correlate to any sort of pattern there? It doesn't, but it, it does create a pathway forward. If, if, you know, we are at this point where we can eliminate these, these things that are holding humanity back, right? Nikola Tesla was creating free energy for everyone in the world, right? He was using the ionosphere to, to draw unlimited sources of power. But what happened, you know, some, some people came in, stopped him and they supported Edison, right? Big money. So, uh, I think it's going to be a difficult future ahead of us. It has a lot more to do with human nature being, you know, exploitative and selfish. And, and your, your worry about Bitcoin being in the hands of so few and, and us propagating that, that exact same playbook over and over and over again throughout history is a little bit concerning. Yes. And, and what can Bitcoin do to stop that? Only really one thing. It can change the way that people serve others because you cannot take Bitcoin away from people. It is unconfiscatable unless they do some Gestapo shit. So, so it is, uh, and that's interesting. So, uh, there, it is. Oh, I see you're saying it. Like they, uh, they can't take it. From you. They can't take it. Okay, sorry. <laughs> okay. They I mean, can't freeze it like a bank account. Got it. Got it. Sam, do you want to hop in a little bit? Yeah. Uh, so, it's a little interesting philosophical thought. Um, to get to your point where can we get to a place where everybody can have some sort of equal wealth, I guess you would call it. Um, no, I, I want to be clear. I want to, I just, cause I, I want you to, really, it's not equal outcome. I don't want equal outcome. I think there's just, you know, I agree with you that people, some people will do more, but equal opportunity not, of circumstance so like no one's growing up homeless as a child like no one's you know, can't eat no one is starving as a child people have access to you know the best health care right so if you're born with a disease you can still be a functioning human being so you know how does bitcoin um you know sorry that's really i just want to be clear it's not it's not equal wealth i don't i don't think that's a concept it's not it's just equal opportunity to move to to generate wealth so having a baseline foundation of a higher floor. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of access to food, health care, um, and living uh, space, I guess you would say. Yeah. Um, well, I guess, I mean, if we ever got to that point where everybody in the world was able to be taken care of, um, we all reached this point where there's enough food to feed everyone, there's enough you know, uh, what have you for basic human needs, right? Um, in order to collapse this extreme wealth versus, you know, everybody else, would there need to be a currency to begin with, right? Would, if you want to take away the power from the wealthy, make currency completely worthless, right? Get to, if we're at a point where everybody has the basic, you know, level of living, and you don't want to have the power to the wealthy anymore, then you take away the the thing that gives them the power to begin with, which is the power of money, right? So <laughs> in that sense, I would say all, all currencies worthless, right? Like, let's make, just make all currency worthless, like go on a barter system of skills and, um, you know, things that I can do for you or things that uh, is worth something to you that I can provide, right? Um, in that sense, right, just like no point of currency, right? But I, I don't think, um, well, you know, to Joe Saz's point, 
that I also agree is the only thing we have or Bitcoin has to make this change that you know what uh, you're speaking about is how to put the power uh, kind of equally um, you know through through some redistribution or, or such um, but for me again in my mindset it's like you you will always have this great amount of wealth within such a concentrated group of people and high levels of poverty globally like I, I don't think that will ever change. Like that's just my point of view. I believe Bitcoin will give the power to make a change in somebody's life, as you know, as uh, Joe mentioned, um, and in the different you know methods of uh, Bitcoin, being that it's unconfiscatable, government can't touch it. Um, it's decentralized currency. You know, you can use it globally anywhere you want. Um, it, you know, it's it's um, uh, peer to peer, and uh, it's anonymous. You know, so there's there's tons of things that make it worth more in the sense a technology perspective versus fiat and how we currently have a system where we're kind of just making money for it to be in a sense worthless, and the governments and and you know the those in power can just continue to print more, uh, driving the the price down to hurt those of us who are not on the same level playing field as them, you know? So I think this will always be the case. Uh, Bitcoin changes it a little bit, you know? Um, but again, if you want to, if you want a worldwide global change, take away the very power that makes these uh, wealthy, you know, have power in the first place, which is money, right? Let's just get rid of money and let's just start uh, from zero again old school right um so that would be uh my my spiel thank you sorry so guys i want to move on this has been um like we're going we're, we're winding down so i have like uh, one longer question and i i think it would be really interesting for both of you guys and um one short question so I want to, what are the implications about, and, and can you tell, can you be very brief, like you imagine you're speaking to a bunch of uh, lay persons like myself, privacy focused uh, currencies, right? Privacy focused crypto. So uh, I think it's Monero, right? ZS Snarks. Tell me about those. And then one, in, one thing I, I imagine, and I would love your perspective on, would be really valuable for a crypto like Bitcoin. Uh, or alternative is some sort of like hyper local exchange. Imagine you have a town, right? And it's like, we're going to do services, you know, maybe you earn, it's almost like for lack of a better term, a social credit score, uh, you know, but using some sort of, uh, you know, cryptocurrency as a ledger to, you know, transact among a small group of participants um, to allow more unique ways of living. Maybe, you know, 10 people want to go build a town for themselves in the middle of the United States, right? And, and they have this thing. So, you know, what kind of, let's start with those privacy focused ones. And then tell me if you think like there's any opportunity for like local, how, how does crypto work locally? Do you want to go? Oh, I think you're on mute. As far as privacy is concerned, uh, I'm, I'm a, toxic Bitcoin maximalist. I don't think we need multiple uh, a coexistence or a multi-coin ecosystem. I don't think uh, privacy coins are actually not really that private. Zcash, for example, has repetitively failed at that. Monero keeps hard forking to become ASIC resistant. Uh, um, so I, I don't really think privacy coins are going to dominate the future. Of course, the concept of, you know, being completely uh, in, in uh, untraceable on chain is good. And I think that there, there are already implementations that are probably in the finalization and implementation phase toward that implementation phase of that particular Bitcoin improvement pro proposal. Um, you know, Schnorr signatures, uh, by my understanding, it, you know, kind of, uh, um, combining a lot of transactional data and making it harder for companies like chain analysis to monitor things. I, I, I think Bitcoin is already doing enough to be the an anonymity coin. So I, I don't see a multi-coin ecosystem here, and I don't see a need for most of these scams to exist. Um, maybe, and I don't even think they're competition to Bitcoin. Bitcoin is competition to itself. 
So uh, I, I don't see uh, a, a need for, for other uh, a coexistence or a multi-coin multi ecosystem or even a fiat combined system with Bitcoin or something like that. Um, but I want to make sure I, I want, you know, Simon to hit this and I want to make sure I get your question right um, before we continue. But Simon, why don't you say uh, your thoughts? Oh, um, I mean, this is more of a technological question. I, I've traded the privacy coins in the pa past based on news and, you know, made a little bit of money from there. Um, other than that, I, I agree with Joe. I don't see any point of having this multi crypto, um, you know, ecosystem that everything works together. Um, I'm also Bitcoin uh, maximalist, but I, you know, I'm on the ed or the side to where I still think it's something to, that's speculative that I'll invest in, uh, but I'm not going to put, I'm not going to put my, you know, bank into it, right? I, I still believe in having uh, quite a, a diverse portfolio at this point. Um, but yeah, so I, I don't have much to say about the privacy coins. I, I also don't think they're necessary. They're just not doing, they're, they're not doing what they promise. And I don't think they can deliver on what they promise without compromising security, A, and B, they are not decentralized. They have a dev team. They have a yeah. known dev team. They, everything that is being done is by a company that you can sue. It's not, that's not decentralized. What, what is decentralized and why we keep bringing that point up is because in order to change anything about the protocol, it requires consensus from anyone participating in the network through operating a node. And again, that could be anyone. That is the decentralization element that matters most is that everyone has an equal voice, whether you have 0 0.00701 Bitcoin or whether you have no Bitcoin and you're operating a node, it doesn't matter, you have a say. And, and that decentralized element is something that simply cannot be replicated. Bitcoin, the way it was done, Satoshi disappearing with a ton of, a huge bag, uh, we don't know, you know, we can go down that rabbit hole, say it was invented by the CIA, the Rothschilds, whatever, right? But, you know, don't know. But what I do know is in order for Bitcoin to change, if say they wanted to implement some sort of user identification, it would require a consensus. And I promise there would not be consensus uh, for something like that. So I'm not a fan of, of centralized dev teams managing some privacy coin that may have the ability to uh, alter your public address uh, when you receive coins so that, you know, it, it looks like it's coming to one thing and then it no, you have no idea when it's being sent. Of course, that's a beautiful feature, but um, Bitcoin can do that. It's just going to require some work to make sure that everything is done without compromising the security of the existing chain. We don't want to have problems. So that's why Bitcoin is a little slow to make some of these changes, but it's because it's slow and methodical. Uh, I believe you had more to, to your question, Ron. Yeah, I was just interested. Well, thank you for explaining that. I really appreciate both of your explanations uh, because they make them uh, much more clear to me. How do, what about practical applications? Let's think about like a small community, right? Because Bitcoin seems to me like a tool that could radically redefine how you interact with others, right? I think that's the whole premise, the underlying theme of one of the benefits is it, it changes our means of exchange with each other, how we interact with each other. So like, let's imagine a, a really local scenario, your town, I mean your town, not your city, like not your, you know, state, you know, let's say your town, whether you live in a town of, you know, population 500 or population 5,000, any practical imp implementations of whether it be Bitcoin or hypothetically a custom unique token for, you know, or coin for that community? Um, I, yeah, I could, uh, Pitching on this one. Um, so, Ron, um, what was this? You you did like a podcast, that podcast where you talked about a video game. Oh, no, no, no. Maybe this was more of a personal conversation. This was way back when, when you were, you know, a young kid in high school um, playing, I forget, uh, some RPG uh, online massive multiplayer Ultima or something? Ultima Online? Yes. Okay. So Game. you, yeah. So you would, um, I said, I think you told me that you could sell these digital items for real money, right? Like these uh, tools uh, essentially became a currency, 
right, on, uh, online, right? So this is where um, I sit in the middle when it comes to Bitcoin, where will it ever be a globally adopted? That's, that's a really difficult thing for it to happen. It could happen, but it, you know, it, 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 it would, a lot of things would have to happen in order for something like that to take place. Um, what about a small community adoption? Uh, whether if it's just an online community, um, you know, maybe a, a certain towns, I believe Singapore is big into crypto. A lot of places accept uh, crypto for, you know, uh, exchanges of goods and such, um, right? Where, where it, the, in a global sense, it's not uh, adopted, but, you know, to an online community or, or some little, you know, group of people, I think that's totally possible. And it changes the game for a lot of things because again, if you run a node, you get a say in what happens to the coin. And so if you build a community, you should be able to have a say in how this coin can be used or, or you can make a decision. Okay, well, I'm going to accept point whatever Bitcoin that you believe it's worth for this service that I'm providing, right? And so you have this community, and it continues to thrive uh, based on this new currency, you know, and this is not in control by any government, by any um, power at B. You can be a brand new community and just decide to adopt it one day. And it can change, you can change everything, especially if it does eventually get adopted more along the way, the value just continues to go up, you know. So in terms of uh, uh, that sense, I. I think it's totally a great thing for smaller communities, the poor countries. I know there's countries that are trying to dive uh, more of the resources so that they can mine, um, you know, for their own purposes and, and collect Bitcoin uh, because they see it as being the future, you know. Perhaps um, tourist uh, countries might completely adopt the coin and use that as its national currency. Who knows, like, you know, these are all speculation um, things, but it's, I, I think it's totally doable. And um, I see that. happening. Well, it's not too speculative. Uh, and, and let me make sure I had your question correct, Ron, uh, Ron because you, you were just asking about Bitcoin. You were asking about what if a community wanted to create um, farm coin, a farming community wanted to create farm coin and transact amongst one another. Is that kind of where you were going for a little bit or am I correct? Right? Yeah. They okay. Do so <laughs> we have a real world application. We have a, a, a scenario that we can, used to, to, to look at what happened. Uh, we have an actual experiment, which was Venezuela creating the petro dollar, petro token. It was uh, Venezuela's attempt to create a national digital currency and it pretty much failed miserably. It's still fucking worth nothing and no one adopted it. The, they try to pay people in, in petro and, and no one wants it. There's just no demand for that. There's demand for Bitcoin. And uh, so I, I don't see farm coin existing or petro coin existing and and succeeding and thriving because there it, it it all boils down to demand and if you're talking about a socialist country that's trying to rob its people of further value by creating a cryptocurrency uh it, it i just think it's going to end uh, terribly uh, as as it already as socialism in that country already did it remains um, centralized exactly and yeah. centralized by the government, which is, of course, the enemy in this case. Um, so, yeah, I, I think uh, we've seen it fail already. Uh, I don't think Petro is going to change the way Venezuelans live. I think it's, if anything, going to change the way that uh, or, or exacerbate the existing wound of their economy uh, as a result of hyperinflation. Okay, that's interesting. Um, we do have time for another question. So I want to kind of go um, back to Adrian. One thing you, you mentioned at the very beginning, we kind of didn't go too into, so I want to keep it on track, but that's that, right? So I, I wanted to talk about, you mentioned like, um, something about like the market, right? There's always going to be a market, something's down, you know, the market's up. I, I agree with you, right? The free market is, is one of your big passions, it seems like, and I understand. My question to free market enthusiasts is always the same, is that, well, why can't we have multiple markets that exist simultaneously? So for example, you might have, um, and it could be done, I believe, democratically, direct democratically, not through the representative you know, republic. 
um, in the idea where you have, we might vote and say, you know what, collectively as a people, we decide that hospitals are going to exist in the socialized market. So it, it exists under a separate set of laws, separate property and contract, a whole, you know, separate rules of employment and engagement, et cetera, is a unique thing we create and put into motion democratically side by side the standard market. So if I want to make a video game, right? And I want to sell that for profit. Nothing's stopping me from doing that. Nothing's stopping anyone from paying for that, right? Um, because I feel like one of the, when we talk about the crisis and the opportunity for transformation, one of the things that always you know, excites me is our ability to reshape all of the institutions. Like, we're only limited by imagination. So you know, could that have, like, is that something as a free market enthusiast, is that something that you would be open to a more democratic selection of multiple tandem markets existing, you know, at the same time. When you say uh, multiple markets, are you talking about multiple coins, like multiple? Oh, uh, we're just talking more about, uh, he talks about the free, I mean, it's not, it's, it's kind of coin irrelevant because whether we're using, you know, Bitcoin or a dollar or et cetera, we exist in these markets of exchange, right? Where we move goods and services around. So when I talk about like multiple markets, a socialized market, we voted to make, let's say hospitals, a socialized market. That means that collectively through the democracy, people would pay into it and it would be a, a public service. So we, we chose to do that. It didn't impact any other market. It didn't impact any other industry. It's that it's a democratically selected one. So you know, Joe, he, cause he ended kind of with a critique of socialism, but so often, right? Socialism, communism, these are, these are terms thrown around and it's the, you know, and um, it's no disrespect, but I, I don't think they're the best choice of language because they come with these past connotations. There's so much history behind them. We don't have to, that's, we have more options in front of us than just a few closed options from history. We don't have to have socialism. We don't have to have mm -hmm. communism, right? We don't have to have capitalism. We can have hybrid models where we carve out, you know, little, you know, in any way we want. And I, I just think when, when I hear people so pertinent on the free market, I'm always curious, are you open to the idea of a more democratic you know, institution where there's plenty of free markets, but there may also be socialized markets? There's... I'm actually not political for, for this reason. It is because we live in an outdated political system. Politics as we live now with elected representatives were to serve thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of constituents, you know, thousands of years ago, uh, with very inefficient communication methods. Right now, if we wanted to build a park in, you know, Manhattan or whatever, right? You can say, all right, everyone in this local community, uh, it's going to cost, you know, based on the population, it's going to cost a dollar and 12 cents per person. We're going to use this company to build the park. It's going to be built on this location and it's going to take this much time. Swipe right for yes, swipe left for no, maybe a little list of pros and cons. That's a much better um, political uh, use of political technology than requiring an individual to make a decision on the behalf of many when we have efficient communication methods. So I, I think that, um, yeah, free markets matter and, and a, a voice does too. And I think our voice is cluttered right now by the fact that we have 500 plus pockets that can be lined with, uh, with money to say, do this. Right. So I, I just, I, I kind of see what you're saying. I do think that there's a lot that needs to change. And I think Bitcoin is going to be the root of a lot of that change and hopefully a peaceful change. Um, but I, I, I really do think that, you know, it's, it's less of a, um, we're, we're just dealing with outdated political tech and, and it's, it's less of a, a scenario where we need to figure out how to, how to enhance it and more about how to change it. Um, and, and that's going to require people. That's going to require maybe maybe some terrible things in the future I, I, you know as far as speculation is concerned it could be a dark path forward you know people with power tend not to want to give it up so um you know th that's kind of my my two cents on that situation uh, uh i hope i answered your question yeah thank you for sharing simon do you want anything no i don't really have much to add to that that's uh pretty good Cool. So guys, I'll, I'll wrap. First, thank you both so much. This has been enlightening for me. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, I appreciate your time and, and just your input. Um, I'll, I'll end it with this. If you could give, you know, 
uh, one or two reasons, um, obviously Simon mentioned it earlier and I'll make a little blurb. This is obviously not investment advice. Any of this is not the investment advice, but <laughs> if you, uh, you know, uh, you know, let's make an easy question. Just give me a percentage and it could be zero, obviously. It, knowing how passionate you are about Bitcoin, not only for its investment opportunities, but also for its you know, transactional value. Um, you know, if, if you had the opportunity, the button was yours to push and you could push it and it would be a global adoption like that, but you had to lose a fraction of your total Bitcoin wealth to distribute it. You can give percentages. You know, would you push the button? Would you have it globally adopted? Uh, and if so, what would be your maximum, you know, uh, what would you be willing to give to make that happen? Simon? Oh boy. Um, <laughs> I would press the button, but after I bought my Bitcoin at the price that I was hoping to get it at. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough, Joe? <laughs> um, I often say that people come into Bitcoin one of two ways, voluntarily or kicking and screaming. I don't even think that button needs to be pressed. I, I, I think it's far more simple than that. Bitcoin is clearly, in my eyes, a solution to so many problems. And uh, I, it, you're either a part of it or you're not. And it doesn't matter when you jump in. It just matters that you're a part of it. Um, so, you know, if I could press a button and, and Bitcoin was adopted uh, at the cost of, of people losing their fraction or some, some percentage of Bitcoin, I wouldn't press it because I think naturally you're either going to get into Bitcoin voluntarily or kicking and screaming. There's no button that needs to be, even be considered in my eyes. Hmm. That's a great answer. Well, thank you guys again both so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Pleasure to be here, Ron. Thank you uh, for having awesome. me. Awesome. Thank you guys. Right on.